the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'm going to preface this by saying we're going to do uh, what Saturday didn't do. You've heard me preach enough Easter's now, right? You know that you're going to have to respond somewhere along the way. So just keep your ears open. All right, let's practice. Alleluia, Christ is risen. In about four minutes, there's going to be another one. So stay awake. Stay with me, okay? And in about ten minutes, there's going to be another one, okay? All right. Have you ever wondered what that first Easter morning was like? Have you ever wondered, dreamt about what it looked like? Just think about that. Dream with me. Close your eyes and picture that first Easter morning. What do you see? Is there a beautiful, picturesque sunrise? Is it a beautiful morning? Is there maybe fog on the ground? Is the garden where Jesus' tomb was, is there a bunch of beautiful flowers? Is there flora and fauna all over the place? Hey, after all, Jesus did get confused for a gardener on Easter. I think that might be appropriate. You know, three of the Gospels, three of the four Gospels, paint us a beautiful picture, an awe-inspiring, even action-packed picture of what that first Easter was like. Matthew tells us in his Gospel that there was an earthquake because an angel of the Lord came down and rolled the stone away from the tomb and he sat on it. There was literally an earthquake. An action-packed Gospel picture. John tells us that the women ran back to the disciples as fast as they could after they interacted with an angel, and there was a foot race for all eternity that got recorded between Peter and John, and of course, because John wrote the gospel, who do you think won that foot race and got written down, right? John wrote the story, so of course John won the foot race in his gospel, right? They went into the tomb. It's in John that we hear, that Jesus shows up. He appears to a weeping, tear-filled Mary. She confuses him for a gardener. And Luke tells us in his gospel that two men in dazzling white clothes share the good news with the women. They remind them of all that Jesus had taught them, and they run back. And Luke tells us they shared everything they had seen and heard with the disciples. That's not the account or the picture that we get today from Mark's gospel. No, Mark seems to paint a very different picture of Easter for us in his gospel, maybe even one that if we're being honest, I'll say the words for you, that might even leave you a little underwhelmed, maybe even a little confused if we're just looking at Mark's gospel, because it's not the awe-inspiring, action-packed, earthquake-filled, angel or Jesus appearing story that the other gospel writers paint. No. On the contrary, when the women get to the tomb, the stone has already been rolled away. And when they go inside, they see a young man sitting there. Mark's gospel is the only one that doesn't use the word angel at all. To describe this person, only a young man clothed in white sitting there. And he tells us, Mark does, that the reaction of the women to the message that this man shares is this. Mark's words, they went out and fled from the tomb because trembling and astonishment had gripped them. And they said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. So happy Easter. We can all go home trembling, astonished, and afraid, and not tell anyone anything. End of story, end of sermon, let's all go home. That was a joke. That's not what we're supposed to do today. (laughs) But seriously, today's gospel reading from Mark, it paints us an interesting picture of those glorious events of this day. If I had to choose a single word to describe the women that day, as the way Mark tells the story, I'd probably choose the word sullen, I think. After all, they had just spent three years following Jesus, the one who had changed their life. The child Jesus was that Mary had raised for 30-some years after his miraculous birth, and he had just died three days before. And of course, because great timing, it had happened right before the Sabbath day, that day where they couldn't do any work. 
So Jesus couldn't even be properly buried. So they had to wait, these faithful women, 24 agonizing hours. John's gospel tells us that they and the other disciples of Jesus had locked themselves away in a room together because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. And so there they were with their thoughts and their questions after the one that they had believed in, the one, Jesus, who had made so many spectacular promises to them, promises like a peace that passes understanding, Promises like he is the resurrection and the life. Promises like he's going to the Father's house to prepare a place for them. Promises like that he would be the one to fulfill the words of Psalm 23, that his goodness and mercy would follow after them all the days of their life. And the one who made them all of those beautiful, living, life-centered promises was dead. He was dead. They'd seen him brutally be crucified on Friday. So what good were those promises now? So after hearing that two of Jesus' disciples had hastily buried him on Friday night, once they could go out again on that first day of the week, as the sun was just coming up reverently, they took spices to the tomb. And that should be a clue to us about what they expected to find when they got to the tomb. Carrying spices with them meant they were expecting to see a dead body. Now, I don't say this to question their faith, to question their sincerity, but I want to speak to their frame of mind. They took spices because they were expecting to see a dead body, and they were going to do what they knew how to do. They were going to properly anoint him and bury him. They were going to bring a conclusion to this sad story. They were grieving, maybe even sullen women, who went to the tomb with tears in their eyes, with memories of the last three years of following Jesus around on their minds. And when they got there, the tomb was already open, Jesus' body wasn't there. And there was a guy inside who told them that Jesus was alive. That he wasn't there. And so I think they did what was natural. When they went to a grave, when they looked inside and didn't see the dead body they expected, if you went into a cemetery expecting to see your loved one, and the grave was open and their body wasn't there, I think you'd run away terrified too. What just happened here? They didn't understand what was happening. I think it's pretty likely that we know where they went. I'm speculating. But if that had happened to us, I think we'd run right back where we came from. They probably ran right back to that locked room with the other disciples to say, what in the world is going on here? Trying to figure out what was going on. They ran away. Trembling and astonishment had gripped them. They didn't say anything to anyone, for they were afraid. Mark doesn't paint us a very beautiful picture of that day. He doesn't give us a picture filled with joy and faith and flowers and sunrises when we look at the women. In fact, this is where Mark's gospel ends. The last words of Mark's gospel is the reaction of these women is the very words that you just heard. The very last three words of Mark's gospel is, they were afraid. End of story. So if I were you, I'd be looking at me saying, Pastor, what are we doing spending time with Mark's gospel on Easter? Why is this the reading today? What is going on here? I thought it was Easter. I thought we were supposed to be celebrating. Hello, do you see the flowers? you see the white? Why this? Why would we focus on Mark's gospel? Because let me remind you, today is not about the disciples. It isn't about 
whether it was sunny or rainy on that first Easter. It doesn't matter if there were flowers or just dusty, sandy desert ground around the tomb that day. What matters and where we should focus our attention is on the words of the angel that day. We should focus our attention on Jesus today. So listen again to the message that that angel told them on that first Easter. The angel said, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He has risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. It's like the angel is saying to the women, hey, I know why you're here. I know what you're looking for. Look, like really, actually, literally, look. This is where he was laying. He's not here. He's risen. And more than that, go. Tell Peter, tell the disciples that Jesus is going ahead of you, just like he said. You're going to see him. So to say that the women were surprised, probably an understatement. From sullen to surprised now. See, what the Gospel of Mark does for us today is so important and so beautiful in our lives of faith because it reminds us and it encourages us that the same thing that's true for you and me today was true for the women that day, that faith comes before sight. Faith comes before sight. They hadn't seen Jesus. He wasn't going to show up yet, but they had the words of the angel to them saying, hey, believe it. Believe what he told you. He's going ahead of you, and you're going to see him. You see, there wasn't a miraculous appearance of Jesus to the women at the tomb in Mark, and that's okay. That's okay. Because the angel promised them something even better than that. That Jesus was already one step ahead of them. That Jesus was about to keep his word to them and show up in their sullen, locked room and to prove to them that his word and his promises could be trusted. To prove to them that his word and his promises were true. Jesus was going ahead of them. He was leading the way as their resurrected, victorious king whose word and his promises were true and could be trusted. I know it might have felt a little strange to say the words of Psalm 23 on Easter morning. We do that responsively at funerals, I know, but with those words echoing around in our hearts and our minds today, we remember today, what we celebrate today on Easter, is that we have a Savior who has not only walked through the valley of the shadow of death, but has come out of it on the other side. And he's not only going before us, but like the last verse of Psalm 23 promises you today, his goodness and his mercy are following after you. They're chasing after you all the days of your life. You see, Easter, it's not a day to be sullen, not even really a day to be surprised, but it's a day to be reminded that you are surrounded You're surrounded by the presence, by the promises, by the goodness and mercy of Jesus Christ. Why? Because Christ is risen. risen And that changes everything for us. That changes the whole ballgame. Because being surrounded by Jesus' love and mercy, knowing all the promises that he's made us, and now hearing that he's going before us, changes our lives forever. It changes everything. Because it allows us, as we live our lives here and now today, trusting in his word, to direct our eyes away from ourselves and to live with hope and peace, and joy, and confidence. 
whether it's a beautiful morning or whether it's one that just feels broken and bitter and everything is wrong. Because Jesus has promised, no matter what kind of day it is for you, that not only is he going in front of you, leading you, but his goodness and mercy are chasing after you too. You are surrounded by the goodness, the presence, and the promises of Jesus. So he promises you that as you go into the operating room, not only has he gone right in front of you and leads you in, but his goodness and mercy is chasing after you there too. He promises you that he's already gone ahead of you and is going there. He promises you that when you go into your workplace that feels like it is grinding you down into a pulp, not only has he walked through those doors ahead of you each day, but his goodness and his mercy is chasing after you there. He promises you that when you're taking your aging parents, your spouse, your loved one to what feels like the hundredth doctor's appointment or rehab appointment this month, that not only is he leading you, going before you there, but his goodness and his mercy is chasing after you there. He promises you today that as you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, the loss of a spouse or a loved one, not only has your Savior led you, already walked through it and gone to the other side, he's finished that path through sin, death, and the devil, but his goodness and mercy are chasing after you there too. Even in the valley of death, you are surrounded by the presence, the promises, the goodness and mercy of Jesus Christ, the risen, victorious King. Brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, because of his resurrection, we are not sullen as we approach the tomb today. We remember that we are surrounded by his presence, by his promises, by his goodness and mercy. And because that's true, because we're surrounded, because he's risen, we know that his promises are true. We know that they can be trusted. We know that our future is secure. We know that we are surrounded by the love and the grace of the one who has defeated death itself every day of our lives. We have nothing to fear no matter where we go because Jesus goes before you and his goodness and mercy is chasing after you wherever you are. You are surrounded by the love, the mercy, the presence of your resurrected King Jesus. Why can you trust that? Why do we have hope and peace and joy? Because Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, amen. Continue as we sing our hymn.